Voltaire has influenced me in many ways. For instance, he is why I am suspicious of censorship and religious power structures, and why I am impatient with specious rhetoric. Voltaire introduced me to la clarté française, French clarity, which lasted until 1945 and then has progressively disappeared. <laughs> the Voltairean spirit has infused my personal philosophy, has inspired a few of the things that I've written as well, um, as a tiny cog in the vast international Voltaire industry. There they all are, gathering dust in libraries. <laughs> Even the hero of my first published novel is writing a biography of, guess who? Voltaire. And I have directed what I think is the only Voltaire play to be performed in Australia under the title of the French Relapse. Um, an adaptation which I did for the uh, Melbourne French Theatre. The first work that I read by Voltaire was his Lettres Philosophiques, Philosophical Letters. It was one of the set texts for high school certificate French in England. At 16 years of age, I was profoundly impressed by this work. Once I got my head round the French. Why? Because it brought home to me how lucky I was to be living in a free country for all its failings and despite the bombs now falling on us every night. It was September 1942. France, a country that I already loved for its impressionist music and for its language, had been occupied by the Germans since 1940. In a situation similar to the France that Voltaire was exile from when writing these very letters, an oppressive tyranny. Even at two centuries removed, the Nazis recognized Voltaire as a natural enemy. During their occupation of Paris, they destroyed the statue of Voltaire. It, he was the key thinker that the Vichy government, the co collaboration government, feared most. So they banned the teaching of Voltaire in French schools during the whole of the German occupation. François-Marie Arouet was born in 1694. That's only nine years after 1685, according to my calculations. So what? There on the 22nd of October, 1685, Louis XIV committed his most foolish act. He revoked the Edict of Nantes which for nearly a century 
had uh, allowed a measure of religious freedom to Protestants in France. So, when François Arouet was born, religious tensions and persecutions of heretics, that's to say non-Catholics, were still rife uh, in France. Whereas in England, in 1690, only five years after the revocation, William and Mary signed the Bill of Rights ending the divine right of kings. Francois's father was a legal officer and a tax collector, a petty provincial nobleman, respectably bourgeois, an austere Jansenist, and very well off. He wanted uh, Francois to study law. Instead, young Arouet, who renamed himself Voltaire about 1718, and this is how he did it, he became a prolific writer, famous throughout Europe, hobnobbing with Europe and Russian kings, queens, statesmen, nobles, famous writers, pouring out tragedies, comedies, poetry, novels, essays, philosophical, historical, and scientific works, more than 20,000 letters, over 2,000 books and pamphlets, in all about 15 million words. On his return to France from England in 1729, he realized that since he lacked rank, money was essential for his protection and his success. So, what did he do? He amassed a fortune by some smart work on the national lottery, and so he became financially secure. By the end of his life, he was the richest private citizen in Europe. Much better off than his father ever was. However, wealth was not an end in itself. Nor was it enough to ensure immunity from censorship or safety from imprisonment for expressing unwelcome ideas. His books were censored and burned, and he of, of, often had to publish anonymously. Despite this, Louis XV appointed Voltaire as royal historiographer in April 1745. But it was only at the urging of his mistress, the king's mistress, the liberal-minded and cultured Madame de Pompadour of Doctor Who fame. Uh, he got a, a salary of 2,000 pounds a year and a room at Versailles, which stank, he complained, because people would piss in the corridor outside his room. So much for hygiene at Versailles. It's not clear why Louis XV exiled him from Paris ten years, ten years later in 1755, probably because he was piqued that Voltaire had gone off to a rival court, that of King Frederick of Prussia, the enlightened despot. So when Voltaire escaped from Frederick's clutches after three years, 
he found on his way back from uh, Prussia that he was barred from Paris, the only place to be for uh, an 18th century French uh, gentleman writer, and he had to live in exile for the last 23 years of his life. Voltaire's works are literature engagée, committed literature. Even his plays, fictions, and poems were vehicles for his deeply felt expressions of disgust at l'infâme, the infamous, the abuse of power by absolute authority, aided and abetted by the official church. I'd love to talk to you just about his plays and novels, but it's not this aspect of his work that I wish to focus on. What is important about Voltaire now is not the same as during most of his life, and not for the same reasons. Let's start with those philosophical letters. These so-called letters are, in fact, Voltaire's reactions to being unjustly exiled for two and a half years in a relatively, I say relatively, free and tolerant society. Whereas his own country, France, was a theocratic tyranny based on fear and violence and ruled, however incompetently, by absolute monarchs. When the Lettres Philosophiques were published in French, they came out first in England, in English, where it was a bestseller. Um, when they were published in French in France in 1734, immediately an order was sent out for Voltaire's arrest and for the book to be burnt by the public executioner because it was, quote, the greatest danger for religion and public order. Oh, yes, indeed. For example, letter five on the Church of England began with this dangerous statement. This is the country of religious sects. An Englishman as a free man goes to heaven by whatever road he pleases. This statement seems innocent enough but not to one of the 76 censors in France. A book published without permission might be burned by the public executioner. The writer, the printer, and the vendor could be arrested and sent to prison. Many of Voltaire's works had the honor of being burned, both in France and sometimes in Calvinist Geneva. Voltaire does point out in letter five the handicaps imposed by non-Anglicans in England, which were very far from being as cruel as those imposed on heretics in France. However, it is, above all, the tolerant atmosphere of London compared to Paris which strikes him. The first four letters are devoted to the Quakers. He quotes approvingly a Quaker's remark. Thanks to the Almighty, we are the only people upon earth that have no priests. Wouldst thou deprive us of so happy a distinction? 
Letter 6 on the Presbyterians. If only one religion were allowed in England, the government would very possibly become arbitrary. If there were but two, the people would cut one another's throats. But as there is such a multitude, they all live happy and in peace. And letter 13 on John Locke. Locke. Theologians are too apt to begin their declarations with saying that God is offended when people differ from them in opinion. This is a very wide-ranging and original social, literary, and philosophical commentary, flattering undoubtedly and distorted Un undoubtedly, but incorporating a good deal of research and a lot of acute observation. Hallmarks of his later works as a historian and as a, a social critic. He loved English theater, for example, and learned his English by going to the theater every night um, but thought that Addison, because he knew the rules of tragedy, was superior to Shakespeare, whose tragedies were, quote, tasteless, monstrous farces. This is one of Voltaire's several blind spots, not his biggest by any means. There were two conflicting impulsions in Voltaire, I think, acceptance and rebellion. He felt the need to be approved of by those in authority, including God. This tendency clashed with the urge to be an independently minded rebel. That and his education by intellectual, flexible Parisian Jesuits resulted in his adopting a deist stance, a deist. He was far from being an atheist. That's just Catholic propaganda. Since, as a deist, he firmly believed for the rest of his life in a supreme being. Yes, he uh, certainly ridiculed superstitions, <coughs> but he claimed, I always distinguished between religion and the calamities caused by superstition. The trouble is that the distinction is always subjective. One man's superstition is another man's faith. James Fowler notes that Thomas Jefferson and Voltaire were deists throughout most of their lives. Some people, Fowler goes on, may become deists during the independence stage of their development, not wanting to be part of any institution or under anyone's control. Now, to imply that Voltaire's hostility, hostility to the oppressive Catholic Church in France was a sort of adolescent rebellion that he should have grown out of is very wide of the mark. In fact, Voltaire became even more hostile to the church as the screws were tightened after the 1750s. That's to say, as fanaticism grew stronger. Let me mention here two of his most famous quotations. 
are like Shakespeare. He's full of quotations. First, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. He never did write or say this. It's an accurate uh, 1907 paraphrase of what Voltaire did write in defense of a book which he disagreed with, a materialist, uh, atheistic book, which was burnt in 1758. Another famous quotation, genuine this time, is widely misunderstood as nobody takes the trouble to read the next few lines of the poem. Yes, it's a poem. Si Dieu n'existait pas, il faudrait l'inventer. A perfect Alexandrine. Twelve syllables. So that should have uh, alerted people. Uh, this is usually interpreted as meaning God is necessary in order to keep people in order. But next, have a look at the next few lines of the 1768 poem it comes from. If God did not exist, we'd have to invent him. Wise men should proclaim this, and kings beware. Kings, if you oppress me, my avenger is in heaven. So learn to tremble. It's those who abuse power who should watch out. The place of um, religious institutions as power structures in public life was an issue that Voltaire was passionate about. And it is still the central intellectual and social debate <clears throat> in our own time of conflict. But to Voltaire, religious theories were akin to religious theories were akin to metaphysics and he had little respect for metaphysics, which he considered to be vanity and which he derided in his own down-to-earth way, when he to whom one speaks does not understand, and he who speaks himself doesn't understand, that is metaphysics. So abstract speculations were simply not worthwhile killing anyone over because no truths, even verifiable ones, would be accepted universally and freely in all cultures. Voltaire thought justice for all was the fundamental criterion of a healthy society. So he was against slavery and endorsed the principle of natural equality. Every man basically has the right to consider himself completely equal to other men. And he said of the peasants, the most useful portion of the human race, the one that feeds us, cries out to its protectors from the depth of its misery. He believed that it is among the poorly educated that the most dangerous fanaticism can be found because their ignorance makes them an easy, gullible prey for manipulators of minds. Do we still see that happening? I'm 
sure we can all think of examples. So education is the most potent uh, remedy against fanaticism in secular schools, of course. Lisbon, Portugal, about 10 a.m. on Sunday, the 1st of November, All Saints Day, 1755. The citizens were worshipping at Mass and looking forward to seeing a dozen Jewish heretics being burned alive before lunch. Lisbon was suddenly struck by an earthquake, killing about 30,000 of the uh, God-fearing citizens. Voltaire's immediate reaction when the bad news reached uh, Geneva about three weeks later was to write the poem on the Lisbon disaster. This was one of his most important philosophical poems, a prelude to the writing of Candide, and a bewildered response to the dismissive doctrine or philosophy of optimism. This was proclaimed, among others, by Pope and Leibniz. God's in his heaven and all's well with the world and all for the best in the best of all possible worlds. You remember the uh, marvelous song which we heard uh, from Bernstein's opera on Candide. What was Voltaire's poetic response to this optimistic view? Evil is upon the earth, you foolish philosophers who cry, all is well, just come and see these horrific ruins. I was writing this just as the February bushfires struck Victoria. The rest of the poem asks important but perennial and still unanswered questions. What divine justice is to be seen here? How can you say the dead have been punished for their sins? Why Catholic Lisbon and not London or Paris, cities of vice? Why did an omnipotent God create a world subject to natural disasters? How can they contribute to the greater good? We need a God, writes Voltaire, who speaks to the human race, but no such God is to be heard. We can only suffer in silence. This is a later addition and hope that things will be better one day. Churchmen throughout Europe and even in Russia were furious with Voltaire's Lisbon poem. Another of Voltaire's enemies, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, wrote him what is now known as the Letter on Providence. Rousseau argued that he believes passionately in a benevolent providence and that the disaster was man's own fault because 
if the inhabitants of Lisbon had not lived in a big town, there wouldn't have been so many dead. <laughs> he concluded his long letter thus. Satiated with glory and disillusioned with vain grandeur, you live a free man in the bosom of abundance. And yet you find nothing, nothing but evil upon the earth. And I, obscure, poor, and tormented by an incurable ailment, meditate with pleasure in my retreat and find that all is well. I don't know what you think, but I find that a somewhat complacent, self-centered attitude. 